Richard, there are a host of arguments that atheists give to demonstrate the non-existence of God. I'm going to give you some. I'd like to get your reactions. Top of the list, problem of evil. God allows evil because he allows us a free choice of whether to bring about good or evil, and he makes us responsible for each other and the world. And if we're to be really responsible, we must have a choice of doing harm or good. And he also allows uh, uh, natural evils in the form of uh, um, uh, tsunamis and earthquakes and diseases in order to give us the, ch the chance to uh, respond by being courageous or being uh, uh, patient in, in the face of these evils. And he allows us to be sympathetic or not sympathetic to other people in the face of these evils. So they make possible the us having responsibility for each other and uh, to form our own character. God is hidden. Uh, well, what's usually meant by that is it's not obvious that there is a God. True, but if it, is, if it were obvious that there is a God and that he had the traditional properties, uh, this would mean that every one of our, we would realize it would be obvious every one of our actions was overseen by a perfectly good being who would be uh, taking account of us. And um, if we really knew that and uh, knew he was watching us, uh, if we are natural, if we have any natural goodness, we will want to, as it were, please such a being who is uh, looking in us, on us. Um, and so we would be so naturally inclined to do the good that um, we wouldn't have a serious choice between good and evil. It would be like uh, goings on in the nursery where mother is looking in all the time. You don't hit your brother when mother is looking in all the time. You hit your brother when you think mother isn't there. Uh, it's necessary for God to keep some distance because he, if we really were totally conscious of his presence in this way, the temptation to do evil would be very much less. God is a disembodied mind, and we have never seen any instance of mind or consciousness other than with embodied brains. Yes, but any account of human beings uh, has got to uh, think of them as having two parts, uh, a body and a soul. And we have to bring souls into uh, account to, taking, uh, to describe ourselves because uh, a very simple thought experiment, imagine um, your brain taken out of your skull and half of the brain put into another empty skull and the other half of the brain putting into a second empty skull and um, bits taken from your clone so that uh, and put in these empty skulls and you make the, uh, the, the, the new brains in the empty skulls work again so that you have two living people. Now, which of them is you? Well, they both behave like you and have some of your thoughts and memories, but there would be an unknown truth as to which is you. Clearly, either you might or might not have survived the operation, but mere knowledge of everything in the physical world would not show that you had survived the operation, and yet there is a truth. And that would show that being you is something other than and beyond everything concerned with the physical. And that shows that what you are is something non-physical. You are whatever it is that goes from the original you to one of these half-brains, but you don't know which. So we're already familiar with a spirit which is essentially immaterial. So there's nothing totally remote from our uh, general awareness of the world uh, in postulating a god who has this character. Another argument for the non-existence of God is the violence in the universe. What sort of violence do you have in mind? Do you have in mind the planets clashing into each other? Sure, planet? asteroids, comets, uh, chaos. What on earth is wrong with that? Um, <laughs> violence is a bad thing, of course, if people get hurt and feel pain, but the smashing of one comet into a, into a planet uh, is a beautiful thing. Um, uh, when we saw, uh, uh, I think it was um, uh, several years ago, that um, a comet smashed into Jupiter and uh, it, it was watched by everybody on telly as a beautiful thing. Um, 
the behavior, the regular behavior of the stars and the planets, the regular behavior on top of which there are explosions producing uh, new stars and um, new planets, these are part of the dance of the heavens. They're wonderful. How about the wastefulness of the universe? All this activity, what, it's, it seems so inefficient if, if human beings are the object of, of this whole thing. Well, um, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And uh, God is not short of paint. Uh, I mean, uh, we, if we waste uh, material, we throw away something that could be useful and therefore we deprive ourselves of material which could be put to a better use. But God has an infinite number of materials and nothing can get wa wasted in that sense. Uh, he can create any material he wants for any purpose, but I think the question you're in effect asking is what's good about the uh, um, vast numbers of uh, galaxies, stars, planets and so on, which are probably almost all uninhabited? Answer, well, just look through the telescope. It's a very beautiful thing. It's a dance. Um, uh, people in the Middle Ages, when they had a great deal less knowledge of all the wonders of the heavens, talked of the music of the spheres, the um, music uh, which was so beautiful that humans couldn't hear it, of the uh, spheres which carried the planets right round the earth. And um, uh, we can see it. Um, uh, we can see through our telescopes not merely or not at all really, how it is at present, but how it was in the past and how it gradually evolved. And even if no one else can see it, God can see it. Just as a painting is a beautiful thing, so a living and vast painting is a beautiful thing. And that's what the universe is. How about Steven Weinberg's famous comment that the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Well, uh, it might or might not be uh, pointless if there was no God, uh, but even so, I don't think that's right. Um, it's good in itself, the, these inanimate wonders, uh, and if they throw up life, as they sometimes do, um, a conscious life, this is wonderful. It's wonderful for anybody to have an experience for half a second, um, to be aware of things for half a second, and there's lots of people with lots of awareness having lots of happiness in pretty mundane ways. That's good in itself. Um, but of course, even better is the ability to think and rationalize about uh, things. And above all, given that there is a God to come to know an omnipotent and omniscient being who can help us to perfect goodness and to understand uh, progressively over infinite time the wonders of the universe. How about the religious contradictions? All the different religions in the world with hosts of different doctrines which fight with each other. Doesn't this show the non-existence of God? Uh, well, uh, the, the fact of uh, there being uh, different religions, whose, some of whose essential propositions are contradictory, uh, gives us uh, the opportunity to uh, think through and think through which are right. Uh, we're not given the answer. We're asked to look around and see which makes the best sense of the world or not to bother. And we therefore have the chance to try and find out and try and find out if there's God and get to know him or not bother. And that's one of our greatest choices. What about religious wars when different religions fight with each other? Doesn't that show the absurdity of the existence of a God supposedly behind all of these? Uh, religions differ in the extent to which they uh, permit wars for the purpose of expansion. But certainly the Christian religion provides no justification for having expansion, wars of expansion. To, and uh, the fact that Christians have conducted such wars is a terrible thing. But it only illustrates the obvious fact that people often don't live up to their principles and hide from themselves the parts of their religious creed which... Uh, uh, um, limit them from doing what they feel a natural inclination to do by way of bashing up the neighbors. Um, 
A religion is provided to make saints. It doesn't start with people being saints, and it's terrible when uh, it's taken over for the wrong purpose, but that only shows the need for a thorough religion and not an abused religion. Scholars would say that every fundamental scripture of every major religion either has overt contradictions within them or flagrantly misstates some facts of the world or science or something. So doesn't that invalidate any revelation from a god in any scripture? It rather depends on the religion. For some religions, the book, the written text, is the revelation. And that, uh, I think, is a correct description of Islam. The Quran is the revelation. That is not so for Christianity, because um, for Christianity, the revelation was a person, Jesus Christ, who taught a message and whose message was propagated by the church. That finally endorsed a Bible somewhere around the fourth century, but it endorsed that Bible with all sorts of qualifications that, that um, we, uh, some of it was written for an ignorant people, as Aquinas put it, um, and therefore it expressed uh, its message in terms of uh, outdated science or mistaken history, and all the fathers, the, the theologians of the early church, made the point that a lot of the Bible couldn't be taken literally and so on. That is often forgotten by uh, modern Christians, especially by modern Protestants, who, who think the Bible is, <laughs> is the Christian religion. Uh, the Christian religion is the church and uh, its central teaching, e.g. its creeds, and the Bible as interpreted in the light of those creeds and in the light of what we know about what else has done, God has done in by way of science or history. I'm not sure that strengthens your argument because if one looks at uh, church history and some of the things that they have espoused, uh, they seem a lot worse than stuff that's in the Bible. Well, I think it depends what uh, you have in mind, but um, uh, what uh, phrase I used, I think, was central doctrines, and what I meant by central doctrines, the doctrines which the church councils had seen as codifying the essence of the Christian religion, and the central uh, doctrine, which is espoused by all Christian bodies which derived from the early church, which is still extant, is the Nicene Creed. And uh, I uh, don't think the Nicene Creed is open to that sort of accusation. Of course, certain branches of Christianity have at times propagated certain doctrines, but what I, uh, and um, the church has always recognized that one has to work out doctrines and not everything that somebody is espousing at a given time has really uh, captured the essence of Christianity. Um, but uh, what, uh, Christian councils have endorsed and subsequent councils have endorsed and has been universally recognized, that I would stand by. Well, that's my atheistic list. Uh, what do you think of the totality of it? It doesn't work. <laughs>